to work circumspectly in this world, oh God. Father, to be the examples of in Christ that they need to see, oh God. Father, not living hypocritical, oh God, but living upright before you, oh God. Father, not being judgmental, Father, but being loving and caring, Father, in all that we do, oh God. Father, being willing to hold them accountable, hold ourselves accountable according to the word of God. Father, that is our prayer right now, oh Lord, and we pray that you will strip us, keep us a God, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty, God's children. All righty. We are, uh, I told you all last Saturday, last Saturday, sorry, last Monday that we were, I was finished out when we were in Luke chapter 24. We were on the Emmaus Road, and I wrote it down in my notes. It says, start at verse 20. So we are on Luke 24, beginning at verse 20. Uh, Be mindful that the May we are still on the road to Pentecost, right? We are now in the uh, Easter tide where Jesus is resurrected and he is appearing to his disciples, amen. He is appearing to his followers and he's showing his followers um, that he is still alive, that he is alive, that he is um, alive and that we have hope in him. So we started with this Emmaus road and they were walking down the road. If you don't know the narrative, it starts around Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Um, it starts with the Emmaus road. You have two disciples walking down the road and Jesus appears to them. However, they do not recognize who he is. They don't recognize who he is. And as a result, they're having a conversation with Jesus and Jesus, and they think they're talking to a stranger and um, Jesus speaks words to them and he encounters them. And um, we're going to see what happens further in this narrative. So we're going to start at verse 20. Um, and how, well, in order to do verse 20, I have to go back to verse 19, which we talked about. So, And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered them, delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happen. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us, not who was with us, went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophecy expounded to them in all the scriptures and things concerning himself. All right. So verse 19 says, um, Jesus is asking them what things because they're conversing. He he walks up to them and like, what are you all talking about? You remember that part of the verse, that part of the text? And um, they say, are you the only one who was uh, only stranger? Only stranger because that was the... Interesting to me that that was the word that they used. That was the uh, uh, adjective that they used to describe this man, the stranger, right? Uh, a stranger uh, uh, describing him, describing the noun. He's a stranger. Stranger is a, is a noun, but uh, it's also an adjective. It's describing how this man uh, is in relative to the world in which he is, um, in which they think that he is around, right? He's strange. He's a stranger. He, he doesn't know what's going on. He's oblivious. And they're trying to get him hip. They're trying to be the um, the, the newspaper, if you will. They're trying to be the, new, be the news feed, the Facebook feed, try to be the Twitter feed, so they can get him hip about what's going on. And that's why he asks in verse 19, what things are you all talking about? Because he wants them, he wants to get them to have an understanding of what their what their issue is right because he's going to bring back to mind he's going to bring all this back to their mind later in the text which we just read so in verse number 20 uh he says um finishing off verse number 19 the things concerning jesus they said to him the things concerning jesus of nazareth who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before god and all the people and how the chief priests the the the, the two disciples on the road to emmaus are now describing to whom the man whom they perceive to be a stranger. They're now describing to him uh, who this Jesus was. Uh, they say, um, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucify him. 
they are casting the, the judgment of Jesus onto uh, the, the rulers of their faith and, and they uh, want them to ha want this stranger to have a recognition that the rulers of their faith are the ones that had him killed, right? Uh, the chief priests and our rulers deliver him, deliver him to be concerned. So you have to have this understanding that when the church and the state gets together and they get together for the demise of someone, something terrible is going to happen because that's exactly what happened. The church got with the state because uh, the church, the, the Jewish way of dealing with uh, a blasphemy is stoning. Right, the Jewish way of dealing with blasphemy, while archaic, was to stone because that is where what uh, the, the the punishment uh, that was required according to the law. So Jesus is not killed by stoning. He is not killed by uh, a Jewish way of uh, of capital punishment. No, he is not. He is not stoned. He is not uh, after being stoned burned. He is not. Um, stoned and hanged as a as a, an effigy to to show the world the wrong that he has done. No, the the Jewish leaders get together with the Roman leaders, and the Jewish leaders are willing to give up uh, their 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 own witness in the world because uh, you have to have an understanding of what's going on, the socio political uh, background of what's happening in Rome in the days of Jesus, right? So Israel is a conquered people always trying to come out of colonization, right? They were conquered in uh, Egypt and then they were put in slavery by the Egyptians. God hears their voice after 420 years, raises up Moses, takes them out of bondage, right? Then they are in the wilderness for 40 years. After the wilderness for 40 years, then they are, they conquer uh, the promised land as God had promised and um, they make it to the promised land and God told them that when they get there that they were supposed to not, they were supposed to one conquer everything which is part of the sermon that I talked about yesterday about Tyre and Sidon and northern Israel which is currently Lebanon, they did not conquer that part because of the sinfulness of Israel because they did not go to conquer it because of their own sinfulness uh, for whatever reason. So uh, they are living in Israel. They're living in, in, in this land. And God told them, if you would keep my commandments, remember, he tells them, if you would keep my commandments, I will be your God and you will be my people. You are going into a land where you did not have to build. They live in houses that you did not have to build. You will eat from vineyards that you did not have to plant. You will um, inherit the land, for I have cast the people, I have cast the inhabitants out. He said, I cast them out little by little so that the beast of the land will not overtake you, right? He, get, he, he literally has a master plan, literally, for Israel, for them to be set up for the direct, if they would keep his commandments and keep his laws, amen. But Israel constantly falls into what sin they fell into sin which is how they got the judges uh after samuel was the last judge they asked for a king uh samuel is resentful of that but god said give them a king they get a king uh who was saul they're about to be conquered by uh, and, and even during the judge they're being conquered by the Hittites, they're being conquered by the Amalekites, they're being conquered by the Perizzites, they're being conquered by the Canaanites they're constantly being conquered because they have not obeyed the word of God. So Israel is a people who is always um, um, trying to fight against colonization, always trying to fight against being conquered, but they're being conquered because of their own sinfulness. So finally around 581, uh, so, so uh, Israel, you remember when the, the kingdom split and it split right during Roboam, uh, Roboam's uh, tenure as the king, that's uh, Solomon's son, uh, as a result, honestly, of the, the, the sinfulness of David and Solomon, because Solomon, while wise, ends up becoming uh, an idol worshiper because of the, the very marriage, political marriages he gets into, and when he gets into those political marriages, those women turn him against God, 
right? That's why he writes with wisdom uh, the book of Kohelet or the book of Ecclesiastes talk about it's all vanity and chasing after wind. So Roboam becomes the one where the kingdom splits. Then Jer Jer Jeroboam becomes the southern, the northern kingdom. He becomes king of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which is called now called Jerusalem, and the northern kingdom is now called Israel. Uh, Jeroboam does not want them to go back to Jerusalem to worship God, so he sets up for them uh, a, a, a idol god. He sets up for them in the northern kingdom idols, the king whom God chooses. And it is so interesting if you read your word, it says that these kings in the northern kingdom, they all were, uh, the, the wickedness and the evilness of who they were was compared to the first king of northern Israel, which was Jeroboam. And it said that they were as evil or more evil than Jeroboam. So again, they're going to be conquered. The northern kingdom is going to be conquered by the Assyrians. They're going to be take, taken away into uh, captivity. Again, these people are people who have been conquered and colonized. The southern kingdom is going to be conquered and colonized eventually around 581 by the Babylonians. They're both going to be taken into exile. So they're constantly being conquered. So how do we get to where we are today in the socio-political aspect of them saying, of, of, of the people saying, uh, talking about the death of Jesus and the death of Jesus not being a Jewish death, but being a death of the Roman Empire. So 581, they're conquered. Uh, they are in ca captivity in southern Israel for 70 years. Uh, and then the Persians uh, ride in. Uh, Cyrus the king rides in. He conquers the um, uh, uh, Babylonians. The Persians sends them back. That's where you get the second, uh, uh, second temple, Israel. Uh, which is the temple built during Ezra and built during Nehemiah's time where the wall is rebuilt. So they're conquered then. Uh, they're, they went from the Babylonians to the Persians, from the Persians to the Greeks. So that is how, uh, and uh, this is where the Maccabean uh, revolt comes from. Um, so during that aspect of, of them being conquered, they're conquered by the Greeks from the, from the Persians. So now they're conquered by the Greeks. The Greeks are there, are now over them. And then this new empire being ran by a man by the name of Julius Caesar conquers the Greeks. The Romans, the Romans conquer the Greeks. And now we encounter the Roman Empire. And Caesar is king and Caesar is Lord. Um, and that is why we encounter when um uh the the the, the high priest is before Pilate. And the high priest, I mean, Pilate says, um, I find no fault in him. And the high priest says to Pilate that if you don't, if you let this man go, he is not our king. Caesar is our king. You remember that? Um, that is literally when they're trying to find fault in Jesus. And Pilate's like, I find no fault in him. Behold, the king of the Jews. And Pilate is like, I mean, the, the king, the Jews are like, he's not our king. Caesar is our king. And if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar, right? Now, it's interesting that these people, these Jewish people are um, claiming Caesar as king because according to, I believe it's Isaiah chapter uh, chapter 10, chapter 9 to 10, they're looking for the one who would be from the shoot of David. So later on, they're going to say, we had thought he was the one. They're literally looking for their next great liberator. They have found a liberator in Moses. They have found a liberator in Joshua. They have found a liberator in judges like Deborah and judges like Barak. They have found liberators in judges like Gideon and judges like Samson and judges like uh, uh, Samuel. They have found liberation in kings like Saul and kings like David. They are, and David becomes the literal uh, 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 gold standard for what a liberator is. They have been looking for a liberator. They are looking for the Camelot days of David that they, their parents and foreparents had talked about because the word of God talks about in the days of King David, gold was like silver. That's how prosperous those days were, right? They're talking, they want to go back to the days literally where they were able to prosper and, and everything that they were doing, they were prospering in their affairs at home. Their vineyards were, were, were had fat grapes. Their economy was rolling in. It was Camelot. They were the um, 
um, able to um, uh, be a conqueror over nations and not being conquered by them. So it's interesting that these people say, if you are a friend of Caesar, being mindful that Pilate is the lowest point on the totem pole, right? Pilate is the lowest. He's like over a little area, like a little mayor of a city. Mayor of a city, Pernus would be like the governor, and Pilate is over the entire world, which is the Roman Empire. I mean, and uh, Caesar's over the entire world, the entire empire. They're telling Pilate, who was low on the totem pole, they're looking at Pilate like, if you are a friend of the king, and the king literally sets you up as a vassal government, you would definitely have this man killed because he's calling himself the king. And you know you don't like how um, appealing now to the ego of Pilate and appealing now to the ego of the Roman Empire. You all don't want to have any other king because it was at the birth of this very child when the, uh, the, 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 the wise men came looking for him that, and said, we are looking for the king of the Jews. That King Herod the, the second literally says... That who, how, how dare you uh, make another king? So it's interesting that these people, uh, these Jewish people are so willing to give up, one, the tradition. And I always tell you there are three things that they hold firm to, the tradition, the Talmud, which is the law, and the temple. They were so quick to give up those three T's, the big T's is what I call it. They're so quick to give them up to rat and to give, to put Jesus out. So that is the socio-political world, the background of why uh, Jesus dies on the cross and does not die with rocks, right? So when, he's, when they're saying we thought that he would be the one, verse number 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers deliver him to be condemned to death and crucify him, they're literally indicting the Jewish people. Why? Because the Jewish people gave up those those big three T's, you know, the time of the tradition and the temple, literally to have convicted the one who claimed to be the son of God. This man who had been preaching for the uh, kingdom of God is at hand. You know, get prepared for the kingdom of God. They're, they're saying, they're indicting the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders who was willing to give up Jesus for the sake of their own. And, and the Jews did, and they would say they did it to preserve the three T's because it's also in the word of God that says, um, preadventure that it is more important that one man should die than for all of them to go falling after him, right? So that's important. So verse number 20 indicts the Jews. It's an indictment on Judaism. It's an indictment on the traditions of that day. It's an indictment on them or on the Jews because they were willing to give up Jesus and willing to do it and give up one a, a tradition that they they have been holding fast to for almost a thousand years looking for one to sit back on David's throne and then looking for one and even today the Jews are looking for one and Elijah is the one who they think will be the one that comes back right so verse number 21 um, and it says in verse number 20, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Uh, redemption. So when we're talking about when, when they make the same, first, you have to understand what redemption means. Redemption literally means to buy back. When, when they're saying we thought he would be, we thought he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel, uh, they indict Israel in verse 20, and then they themselves indict themselves in verse number 21. Having not believed and having not having understanding that these things had to happen, which is what Jesus says later on, that these things literally had to happen in order for the Son of Man to rise from the dead. And it is part of a bigger plan. And they did not have the the insight, they did not have the, the sight or the foresight to have the comprehension that Jesus, although he told them this thing, although he had been the one who had been preaching to them that it was in Jerusalem where he had to go and in Jerusalem, he would be betrayed. They did not have a concept of it. And they now indict themselves and say, we thought he was the one. This redemption piece is very important because again, they are looking for one. They are looking for um, Jesus, they're look, not Jesus. They're looking for the one who's going to sit on David's throne. First Isaiah. I want us to turn. I believe it's verse Isaiah. I want to say it's chapter nine when it talks about the stump from the root of David of Jesse. 
Um, if it's not nine, it is eleven, and it's actually in both of them. So, and this is really a Christmas scripture because we're look Advent, looking towards right, looking towards the coming. That's what Advent is. Uh, let's read in uh, Isaiah chapter nine, which is ties right into what we're talking about now. Um, the government of the promised son, the promised son, and this is uh, this is the they 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 honored Isaiah. Jesus quotes. Isaiah more than any other Old Testament prophet, right? So listen to what Isaiah the prophet, whom they would rever, and his words whom they would rever, because when Isaiah is writing this, he's writing, and it's supposed to be three three writers of Isaiah, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah, he's writing this to a people after the king had died, King Uzziah, right? He's writing this, and he's telling them that there is hope to come. So they're looking for hope. So it's interesting that they say we thought he had been the one. Uh, let's read this. Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Talking about Israel. And as when at first, he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. And after more heavily oppressed her um, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And Galilee of the Gentiles. That's northern Israel. right? The people who walked in darkness um, have been a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Talking about the one who is coming to deliver. Um, they rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden. Talking about the great man, one who will redeem. This is what Isaiah is talking about. Um, the rod of the oppressor. And it, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior sanders from the noisy battle, and garments robed in blood will be used for burning and fuel of the fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and Peace, there will be no end. They're looking for this one. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment from that time forward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So they're looking for one. They're looking for an evangelist. They're looking for a redeemer, which is so interesting that these people who are indicting, literally indicting the, 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 the tradition, the Talmud and the, uh, and the temple of Israel, they themselves are indicting themselves because they, we thought he was the one. We thought he was the one who would redeem us. They're looking for a great redeemer. But let us go to chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11. Talks about this even further. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 11, beginning at verse 1 says. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Understand who Jesse is. Jesse, the stem of Jesse, is David. Jesse is David's father. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, out of David's roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the way. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf shall lie with the lamb. The leper shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young, the, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze their young. One shall lie down together and the loin shall eat straw like ox. And the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaning child shall be put in his hand in the viper's den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, and the waters of cover the sea. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, talking about one coming from David, right? Who shall stand as a banner of the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. This is all talking about Jesus, right? The Gentiles shall, if you heard the sermon on Sunday, it was a Gentile. 
It was a Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile, who goes to seek after this one who is called Jesus to Christ. A Gentile shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand upon the second time to recover the remnant of, the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, people who have been conquered, being mindful that northern Israel had been conquered by Assyria, and Egypt, where they had once been conquered, from Pethros over to where the Greeks are, and Cush down in Africa, Elam and Shinar, Shinar over in Turkey, uh, over there, from Hamath and islands of the, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah, being mindful Judah is southern Israel. From the four corners of the earth, also the envy of Ephraim shall depart. They're literally talking about one who is going to be the great redeemer, and that great redeemer is Jesus. So these disciples, these two disciples walking along this road, not only indicts the Jewish tradition, the Jewish Talmud, which is the law, and the Jewish temple, they indict themselves because they we thought that he would be the great redeemer. And the great redeemer is the one who comes from the root of Jesse. And the one who comes from the root of Jesse is the one who's going to redeem us from all this stuff that we're going through, right? Elijah does not come from the root of Jesse. Elijah is a Tishbite from northern Israel. Elijah does not come from the root of Jesse. Jesus comes from the root of Jesse right through uh, uh, his father, Joseph. If you go start at Jesse, then David, then Obed, and you go all the way down the line. If you go all the way from J Jesus, I mean from David down to 42 generations, you get to Joseph, and Joseph betrothes Mary, and Mary is the mother of Jesus. They are literally talking about the old, in the Old Testament a man by the name of Jesus whom they cannot grasp who he is because of their own blindness, their own uh, uh, insecurities, their own ignorances, their own issues. They cannot grasp that it is Jesus whom they had been looking for, this great redeemer of Israel. Why cannot they cannot grasp him? Why they cannot grasp is because Jesus has not come riding on the horse. But you remember on Palm Sunday, he comes riding in literally on the donkey. Right? So they cannot grasp how this man who is a, a, a wanderer, right? He's wandering throughout uh, all of Israel, northern and south. He's from the north, right? Nazareth is a northern city, right? They know that, G that, that, that David is from Bethlehem, a southern city, right? But being mindful that Jesus literally is born in Bethlehem because God set it up that he was going to have to be born in Bethlehem because of a census, right? They're looking for the Redeemer, and they say, we thought we had found him. The people who had followed him, the people who had seen him turn water into wine, the people who had seen him heal people, the people who had seen him do um, all manners of miracles, they had seen this and they still have doubts because he dies. But he tells them constantly, I must go to Jerusalem and there I will be betrayed. And he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They're looking at a physical temple through a, a, a carnal eye. They're looking at the, the, the third temple which, is, which has been built, which is after the second temple. They're looking at the temple, the Herodian temple that had been built in Israel, the Herodian temple that had been built in Judah, and they say he's talking about destroying this great temple, and Jesus is talking about something more deep and intrinsic than uh, destroying the temple. He's talking about his body, for we know that our bodies are temples of the Lord. Right? Destroy this temple, in which they would do, and in three days I would raise it up, and he raises it up. And these disciples, while indicting the church, while indicting the people who literally are the people in power in Israel alongside the Roman government, they're indicting themselves because they thought he was the one. If we have to have a spiritual eye, a spiritual understanding to look at this text, to look through the lens of faith to fully understand the true purpose of Jesus. And they could not understand the true purpose of Jesus until he had left and come back again. They could not understand it. Every time we encounter the resurrection, they are shocked, although they had heard him say, because it, they could not understand it until Jesus had left and come back because 
their eyes had been shut. And in our lives, where have our eyes been shut to the hopes of the resurrection because we cannot see it through a lens of flesh because, I mean, through a lens of faith because we are looking at it through a lens of flesh. It is in this flesh that I talked about last month that no good thing dwells. And as long as we look through things through a lens of flesh, we will always find issues because this flesh is limited. That is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I must take off this corruptible flesh and put on incorruptible, this mortal and put on immortality. Why? Because in this flesh there is limits. There is limits in this flesh. And these people are dealing with the limits of their flesh. They're struggling with their flesh. They think that because he died, it is over for him. They think because he is placed in the tomb, that was it. But here is Christ doing something so radical that they had never seen before. They had seen people they had seen him raise people from the dead, right? But they had never seen someone raise themselves from the dead. And everybody that Jesus raises from the dead, Jesus commands something. He tells them to get up. He tells them to come forth. He tells them, but who would now speak for Jesus to raise himself from the dead? And he does this radical thing, raises himself up, and they cannot grasp that understanding of the resurrection. And we will never be able to grasp those things in our lives if we are looking through a lens of flesh. That is why it is so important for us to stay in the spirit, for us to pray in the spirit, for us to get in the spirit. Because in the spirit, the spirit is the only way. Hear me when I tell you the spirit is the only way we are going to be able to to stand against the wiles of the adversary. That is what Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6 says, right? We have to put on the whole armor of God, right? That That is walking in the spirit. That armor is heavy. That armor requires something of us. That armor requires of us physical strength that's not of our own. That armor requires us to stand firm in our faith. And in order to have that armor, or we got to look, live, and talk in the spirit of God. And sometimes I recognize that it is hard to do. And in the flesh, we will never be able to do it. That's verse number two. They in, they're indicting the, we thought he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. They're looking for one who will sit on the throne of Jesse, looking for one who will sit on the throne of David. That's what they're looking for. But we were hoping that it would see who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, they said, indeed, all of this, Today is the third day. Three days since this has occurred. Where have you been, Mr. Whoever you are? Where have you been, Mr. Stranger? Today is the third day now. And those who are in our company, that's what they say in verse 21. Uh, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Three days ago this happened. Where have you been? I don't know how you missed it. But again, Jesus said that he would have to, three days he would be, uh, he would be in the ground and he would rise from the dead. Verse number two, yes, and certain women of our company, talking about the three Marys, talking about the Marys that go to the tomb, um, uh, Mary, uh, 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 Mary Magdalene, Mary, uh, the mother of James the Lesser, Mary of Cleopas, right, I'm, I'm the, the other Mary, right, I'm sorry, the other Mary, the, the three Marys who go to the tomb, he's saying to them, he's saying, these three women have gone to the tomb and they have not found our Savior. They couldn't go on, on Friday night. Why? Because that's when the Sabbath started. They couldn't go any day on Saturday. And by the time the Sabbath was over on Saturday, it was too late and it was dark. So they had to rise early in the morning, early in the morning, in order for them to go to the tomb. And when they finally made it there, they did not find Jesus. They don't find Jesus. They don't find him there. Okay, so the, it's empty. The tomb is empty. And they and it has astonished us. They are still in. Although Jesus has repeatedly repeated this thing, that he would rise, that he would get up, they are still in shock. It's, it, it astonished us. You remember uh, when Mary goes to see him? 
Uh, you remember, I mean, when Mary go, uh, when the, when the two men go, they try to roll, they worry about who going to roll away the stone. All of these, all of these myriad of stories about the resurrection, they're all confused. They're all saddened. Why? They, they try, they think some think Jesus is the, uh, the gardener. They're sitting there crying and, 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 and uh, while we, we, we can be, um, I can, I can teach this from a lens this way because I'm not actually living the history. They are li literally living the history. They had to, they were forced to believe and to be the faith to be transformed in ways that they did not ever think that they, they would have to have their faith transformed. They were born at the right time and they were able to walk the land literally with Jesus and even seeing things, um, they were able to see it real time. We have the privilege of having the narrative right in front of us and knowing how the end is going to be. We know the end of the story. Uh, they did, I mean, although Jesus told them the end of the story, we know the end of the story and the end of the story for us has been rooted in tradition for a myriad of years, for a myriad of years. Yet these women, these women, these men, these people are struggling uh, because they're literally living out history and they're living it out and their faith, which they have tried to walk in the spirit. They have tried to be in the spirit, uh, but Jesus constantly reprimands them. Oh, ye of little faith, right? When the winds and the waves are bad and uh, beating up against the sea, oh, ye of little faith. And he goes and calms the rage and see um, when, when, when uh, he sends them out. And the disciples are going out and they had just healed somebody. And a man brings the, his son who had, who had um, many of demons, right? Many of demons within him. And the, the father says, Jesus, I took them to your disciples and I asked them to heal them. They couldn't heal. Them. Now I'm bringing them to you and I'm asking you to heal them. I know that you can do it. Uh, uh, he says, and Jesus said, does thou have faith? He said, yes, help thou my unbelief. And Jesus turns and he reprimands the disciples and says, oh, ye of little faith. And the disciples are baffled. Their minds are blown. Like you literally just gave us the power and the authority to do these things. And now we can't do it. And Jesus said, it requires fasting and praying. Oh, there's another cheat code to this thing called spirituality. I now have to fast and pray for some things to be transformed. Right. So these people are are trying to live in the spirit. They don't really know what that means, right? They're struggling with it. And now the one whom they have this hope in, the one who they thought would redeem Israel because their tradition had told them that it would look a totally different way than they had, than they experienced it. They're like, he's not the one. So we thought he would be the one. And now we go to, to um, uh, uh, anoint his body and he ain't even there. That was a lot to have to deal with. And so we can be real critical of these people, but these people are just doing the very best they know how, literally. These people walking are walking with Jesus, uh, the, the one who is the bridegroom with them, right? They're walking with him, seeing and experiencing, having an understanding of him through the lens that they know how to have an understanding of, and, and they still can't get it right. And here we are, some 2,000 plus years later, striving, trying to get to this point, striving, trying to get to this spirituality and what we have on our side is we do have the written word of god we do have the, tra the traditions in which we are going through right we do have that on our side however however we still struggle with the spirit knowing what the end result was they're going through it they don't necessarily know what the end result is because they don't have the book in front of them and we have the book in front of them and we still struggle with it they're doing the, these people are doing the very best that they can and what God or Jesus is trying to get them to understand is that the very best you can do, it will never be enough. You have to have one, the one who I will send after me to help you to do the things that I have equipped you to do. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it by yourself. And if you try to do it in the flesh, you're going to fall and fail every single time. Every time we try to do it in our own, our own accord, every time we try to do it in our own flesh, we falter, fall, and fail because this flesh is meant to fall apart. This flesh is literally weak. Jesus tells them, pray with me, and they go and they fall asleep in the garden. Could you not pray for one hour? For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So in this flesh, we will never be able to fulfill what he's told us to fulfill. And these people who had literally walked with him are literally experiencing that in these in these moments. 
for they go to the tomb, he is not there, and they are shocked. Because it requires you to walk in the spirit. The whole, our, our entire faith, our entire religious belief hinges on our ability to look through things through a lens of faith. We are saved through faith. It is by faith that we are able to please God. Without faith, we cannot do anything. It, faith is, is a, a pillar of our religion. And without said faith, we're never going to be able to be the, the wholeness of who God is telling us that we are. And I'm not telling you that the wholeness of who God is telling us that we are is going to make you a millionaire. I ain't telling you that. I'm not telling you it's going to give you a whole lot of money. I'm not telling you it's going to make you always feel good. I'm not going to tell you it's going to always make you have happiness. But this faith will give you joy. And joy is an emotion beyond happy. Joy is the satisfaction in knowing that I am doing the work and the will of God in this world. That is joy. And having faith. Faith is what's going to buttress us towards our God-given goal. So many of us live, be, be, live under our destiny because we are not walking in faith. We are, not, we are a resurrected people living in a Good Friday world, but we still act like Jesus is still in the grave. And our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is not in him dying on the cross. Our hope is not in him being in a borrowed tomb. No, there's nothing radical about death or dying. It's been happening since the beginning of time. But our hope is in the resurrection. And it is in the resurrection that it requires us to have faith. To believe that thing which we have not seen. For we hope in the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal in the heavens. That is why 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 says, For eyes have not seen, and ears have not heard, and neither has it entered into the heart of man. Those things that are prepared for those who love the Lord, and I call it according to his purpose. Why? Because the only way we're going to be able to live out this journey called life in our God-given potential is if we walk by faith, live in faith, and live in the authority of the resurrection. If so many of us walk in the authority of the resurrection, we will have be so much further, not just in our faith walk, but in our earthly walk. Because walking according to the resurrection requires you to walk out on faith. And these people struggle with that because these people faith what has never required them to believe something that they could not see. Even in the wilderness, even in the wilderness, they had a vision of God. They was led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They literally saw God rain down. They had a vision of God. They literally saw these miracles happening in front of them. They literally go out every day to get what is this bread, manna. They bring it back and it's there every day. Provisions being made. They literally see God roll back sand to bring quails. They literally see this. So even in the wilderness, even in the wilderness, they see a, a God and their faith is not required to be on level 2.0 where they're believing and they cannot see it. We are called to believe when we can not see, comprehend, or understand. When God is saying do something, we ought to walk according to faith and stop leaning on this thing called our five senses. But God gave me five senses. God told you to have faith. And if you could do it with your five senses alone, God would not have said it is impossible to please him without faith. He says without faith is impossible to please him. Not without your five senses. So we have to walk in the authority authority of the resurrection and live by faith. That is what Habakkuk and then that is what Paul grabs hold to when he said the justified, those who have been called out, those who are the church, those who are beyond this world, the justified shall live by faith. And a faith journey is a journey that requires something of you. And some of us cannot get beyond ourselves. We want to be in control of everything. I need to have it planned out. I need to see how it's going to go. And here is God saying, just live by it. This is Jesus. 
saying, just trust in me. This is Jesus who's saying, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise from the dead. They, they could not grasp it or understand because they could not, they would not live by faith in this way. And the way of faith we have to live is a deep faith. Now he said he has given each of us a measure of faith. And that measure of faith that each of us should have should be the, the faith, one, the size of a mustard seed that can speak to a mountain and the mouth will be cast for. Listen, if you have that type of faith and the mouth does not move, you still have to have faith that God has gave you the authority to move the mouth. Even if the mouth does not move at your voice and your command, you still have to have the authority. Of, well, God told me that this mountain could move and maybe, maybe the mountain will move or maybe God will change your perspective of what a moved mountain looks like. Like their perspective of what faith looks like had to be shifted and flipped upside down. These people said we thought he was the one. They went to the tomb and they did not say, and they were astonished. How many of us are astonished by the hope of the resurrection? How many of us are astonished by those things that Jesus has said and that have come to pass in our life because we did not truly believe that it could come to pass? I'm going to believe God for everything that's going to happen in my life. Even when I struggle to believe it, I'm going to strive my best to try to believe it as best I can in this flesh. Because I keep telling us that nothing good dwells in this flesh. This flesh, this flesh will keep us away from faith. Flesh will keep you away from faith. So they thought he was the one. And they were astonished. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they have also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So... How they how this even reads? It reads as if they say <laughs> this is what he says. They uh they did not see him, and they say they saw an angel, and it reads as if they even they even judge that they they even doubt that these people have seen the angel to say he was alive. It's like a a whole lot of gaslighting is going on. They're saying this stuff, but we don't believe what they're saying. But that's what they say. But what that's what they say. And certain of those who were not, who were with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. They still are having these doubts. They still are having these doubts. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish, listen, to this is Jesus talking. O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Jesus reminds them reminds them from their own words that they had just spoken. He tells them, these things have to happen. Did not Christ say that they have to happen in order for this to be? Did not Christ tell us that thinking not strange when the fiery trials come up against us and some strange thing is happening to us, but rejoicing as much as we are partakers of Christ's suffering? Did not Christ say that in this world we will have trials and tribulations, but fear not, for I have overcome the world? So it should come as no surprise to us when we as people of faith are going to go through things like we are going through. It does not mean that we are not his, God, his children. It does not mean that we are not the elect. He said these things have to happen according to the word of God, and you are foolish for not believing what he said. And we ought to stop being foolish and not believing what he said. He said, fear not, for I have overcome the world. Praise God that we have. he has overcome the world and even as he has overcome the world we shall overcome the world for we are not conquerors we are what more than conquerors in him who loved us right so we have to have that type of faith that type of hope because these people doubt it because they did not see we doubt also because we do not see and we have got to get to the point in our faith and in the spirit where we can see things. That's what he said. See things that are not as though they were. See things through a lens of faith. I see the hope. I see the, I see me walking in my, in my uh, mission, in my ministry. I see me being uh, a, a leader to great nations, carrying the word. I see me being a great children's leader. I see me being a great minister of the word unto God, serving God's people. I see me being a great teacher in not just the school, but I see it in, in, in all spheres of my life. I walk in the authority of what I do not see, and I speak what I do not see according to what I see in the spirit. And we have to see some things in our spirits about the very lives that he has given us and the very ministry that he has 
birthed in us and walk in the authority of that and stop speaking negativity in our own lives but stand firm upon what God has told us. Is there anybody who's going to believe what God has already told you? Believing that he has, believing that, that which he has began in you. He will complete that even until the day of Christ's return. That good work that he has begun in you. You have to have the hope of the resurrection and see through a lens of faith to have that type of understanding. All righty. We are an hour into Bible study. All righty, God's children. It has been a blessed Monday evening. I pray that you all just continue to grow stronger and stronger in your faith. Continue to be uh, people of great faith. Amen. People of great, just like that woman, uh, the Syrophoenician woman on, in the sermon on Sunday, this, Jesus said, thou has great faith, mega faith, big faith, enormous faith, right? Be a people of great faith and live out that faith in your life. All righty, God's elect, you all keep, keep on keeping on until we gather together again on Wednesday. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer in Jesus' name. All righty, have a good one. Bye-bye.